Good evening. If you will grab your Bibles, we're going to do a topical message today. I'm titling this message, The Mystery of Godliness. The Mystery of Godliness. And we're going to look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Uh, we're going to have a number of stops. And uh, as I get there, I'm going to point some, some of them out to you. But if you want to just hold on to Galatians chapter 2, uh, we're going to look at Galatians chapter 2, Galatians chapter 5, uh, as well as Romans chapter 7. So Galatians 2, Galatians 5, Romans 7. So just put fingers in each of those spots. <laughs> might need to use some toes as well <laughs> if you run out of fingers. <laughs> this is one of those studies that have been weighing on my heart, and so I wanted to uh, just share it with you guys but before we get to the Christmas. Again, next year, January, we're going to do an overview of the entire Bible. Uh, it's going to start in January. I'm not sure when it's going to be finished. Uh, we'll be covering probably one a book every week, sometimes, depending on the book, uh, probably two or even three. So we're going to go through it, just a general overview, so that we can have a, a bigger understanding, have a big picture of the Bible and what its message is. I believe we will enjoy our time there. So uh, if you have your spot, First T Timothy chapter 3. Again, let's ask the Lord to bless our time. Father, we ask you, simply just ask you, Lord, to, to be the teacher here tonight, Lord, as you have uh, put this message on my heart. Lord, I pray that it will be delivered by your Spirit and that the hearts of all those who will hear, Lord, will be touched. And uh, we will examine ourselves, Lord, and examine and, and evaluate how we have been doing life with you, Lord, and make adjustments as necessary. So we ask this again in Jesus' name, amen. Last week, uh, Saturday, I went to Walmart to make some purchases for some of the toys and the gift boxes we were going to send down to, uh, to the Bahamas. And as I stood in a line, this young man, he came and he kind of jumped in front of me. He was with, I guess, his friend's. But on his jacket, he had a symbol on the back, an upside down uh, star. And uh, at the bottom of it, he was, uh, it said something about praising Satan, you know. And I just thought, wow, what, 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 what will possess someone to worship a... a, a <laughs> Something that we know that is so opposite of God. What will cause someone to want to worship and even outwardly and publicly proclaim his allegiance to Satan? You know, as I think about it, uh, you know, we, have, we do have some people that are like that. But in general, most people, I think, most uh, have a heart to be good. And may I even go further and say, I have a heart to even be godly. No one wakes up in the morning and say, you know what, I'm just going to be a murderer today. Or I just want to go out and, and live an adulterous life or live as a thief. People don't wake up with that in mind. Most people, I think, really just want to be good. But the problem is... It's really hard to be good, hard to be a good father, hard to be a good husband, uh, a better son or daughter, a, a better boss, employee, employer. Uh, you know, we want to be better, but how do we achieve it? You see, people, I believe, go around, go about trying to achieve it by human attempts, by fleshly attempts. We use human efforts trying to do good in our own strength, trying to be good in our own strength, thinking positive thoughts, hoping that 
maybe if I do good, if I am good, if I'm, I be good, then therefore I'm going to be godly. You know, I think about people even today, especially today, a lot of people are going around thinking, if I just have positive thoughts, then I can be good. If I think it, so shall I be, right? And people have positive thoughts. You know, there's a, a, an American fairy tale story, and most of you probably heard of it. Uh, growing up, maybe you have memorized it. It's called The Little Engine That Could. A little railroad engine was employed about a station yard for such work as it was built for, pulling a few cars on and off the switch. One morning, it was waiting for the next call when a little train of freight cars asked a large engine in the roundhouse to take, excuse me, in the roundhouse to take it over the hill. I can't. That is too much a pull for me, said the great engine built for hard work. When the train asked another engine and another only to hear excuses and be refused. In desperation, the train asked a little switch engine to draw it up the grade, uh, the grade and down on the other side. I think I can, puffed the little locomotive. I put it and put itself in front of the great heavy train. As it went on, the little engine kept bravely puffing faster and faster. I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. As it neared the top of the grade, which had so discouraged the larger engines, it went more slowly. However, it still kept saying, I think I can. I think I can. It reached the top of the draw on, 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 on bravery and then went down, went on down the grade, continuing itself by saying, I thought I could. I thought I could. I think we're all familiar with that story. And the problem with this story is that, well, it is what it is, a fairy tale. You know, people go around saying, if you think you can, you will be able. If you, if you just have positive thoughts, you can be good. You can do right. And that's what is being taught in the world. And sadly, that's what's being taught in the church. You see, what that is, if we take it for what it is, it's self help. I can do good. I can be godly. I can do it by, all by myself. And so people resort to thinking positively. People even resort to religion. When you look at religion, when you look at all of the religions of the world, what is, the, what is religion? Religion is saying, I can try and be godly enough to please God, make it to heaven. So, Man face turn to religion, but oftentimes find himself failing. If you look at the commandments, oh, I'm going to keep the commandments only to find that I'm failing in keeping them. I remember one, one uh, evening, I went to a pastor's conference, and there I was inspired. Oh, you know what I'm going to do for 40 days? I'm going to go into my closet and I'm going to spend time on my knees praying to God, reading my Bible. I'm going to spend an hour every night for 40 days. And I did it that first day. Oh, it was an amazing time with the Lord. It only lasted one day. <laughs> my attempts to try to be godly, it failed in just one attempt. I didn't even get near to 40. You see, if we're honest, religion... Our religious attempts would just leave us frustrated. So man tried to be godly by human attempts. So man tried to be godly by turning to religion. Some others try to be godly by having good desires. You know, if I just have good enough desires, then maybe I can be good enough. You know, growing up, uh, of course... I enjoyed watching basketball. I was a big fan of Michael Jordan. And there was that commercial that said, I want to be like Mike. And everyone aspired to be like, like Michael Jordan. You know, as he played, oh, when he jumped, he jumped 
and, and he soared. And, and the things that he did on the basketball court, oh, every child wanted to grow up to be like Mike. And so if I desire to be like him, can I be like him? If, if I maybe even wear his jersey, <laughs> uh, have a Michael Jordan uh, uh, jersey with the number 23 on it. Oh, maybe if I buy a shoe. Oh, maybe I can jump higher. Maybe I can soar like Jordan did. Listen, it doesn't matter how much I desire to be like him. I will never be like him. <laughs> right? I will never be like him. You know, there was a, 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 a test that was done, a study, a study that was done in in 1986 by a group of researchers, and they published uh, a study of Japanese mothers and mothers of Minneapolis. The mothers were asked to rank the most important thing that a child needs to succeed academically, and the mothers of, the, of Minneapolis chose ability. The mothers of Japan said effort. So you have two different point of views. The, Mothers of Minneapolis are saying, you know what, if my child have the ability, the natural ability, they can do anything. When you look at those in, in Japan, oh, hard work and effort, there I will achieve what I want to achieve. Again, the problem man face is we don't have the natural ability to be godly. Let me say that again. Man does not have the natural ability to be godly. Why? Because the ability that we have, the natural ability we have, is a sinful ability that we inherit from Adam. When Adam sinned, we inherited his sinful abilities. So no matter how hard we try to be good, we will always end up in failure. So what's the solution? Listen, I told you to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Listen to the writings of Paul. And he says, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. You see, this one verse has so much in it, but I want to focus just on that first part. Paul says... Without controversy. In other words, indisputable evidence is what he is pointing out to here. What he is writing, there's no controversy about it. There's no denying what he is sharing. That what he's sharing, well, John the Baptist preached about it. We have the gospel writers, they wrote about it. We have the, the apostle John, he discovered this truth. What is this truth? Look at what he says. Great is the mystery of godliness. A mystery is something that was once uncertain, that was unclear, that was undiscovered until now. You see, throughout the entire Old Testament especially, there was this, this thought, God created us and he demanded that man be, become godly. But no matter how hard man try, it was a mystery to them. Is it possible to be godly? We try to attempt by keeping the laws. We try to attempt by keeping uh, the, the rituals and the traditions. And all that I try, all that I do, all that we do, it seems as if it's a mystery. Can't figure it out. So he says, great is the mystery of godliness. Look at what he says. God was manifested in the flesh. The key to becoming godly not, was not man operating in the flesh, but that God manifested in the flesh. That God would leave his, his heavenly throne, his kingdom, and come down and do what we can't do. And that's be godly. <laughs> so the key, again, to be godly is God manifested in flesh. And by faith, allowing Christ to form in us. When you and I are born again, when we receive Jesus Christ, when we believe on him, what's, what happens immediately? The Holy Spirit dwells in us. God begins to manifest himself in us. You know, when I, my kids were a lot younger, 
of course, going out and cutting the grass. And they want to, of course, help. Daddy, can I help cut the grass? Oh, it hurt my heart. <laughs> because I know it's going to add more work to me. But they, 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 their heart is right. They want to. And so, you know what? I will let them hold on to the little lawnmower. And, and, and as they're pushing it, they, they can't handle it. But you know what I do? I, I stand behind them and, and they feel like they're accomplishing something, right? And that's how it is. With, with Christ living in us, we will be able to do what we can't do in ourselves, and that's be godly. You see, man, we are trying to do be godly, again, without God, and it only leads to frustration. It only leads... And so listen to what Paul says again. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 this time. He says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, listen to what he says, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, I'm going to be godly not by my efforts. I'm going to be godly not because I'm going to do good or do right or think positive. I'm going to do, be godly because I'm just going to, by faith, believe that Christ is going to live in me and live through me and accomplish all he has to accomplish in my life. And it's all by faith. I'm just going to trust him. When I be became a, a Christian, my mind wasn't, oh, I'm going to be a great Christian. My mind was, I just gonna, I'm just going to serve the Lord. I'm going to follow him. And my life began to change automatically. Because why? It is no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives within me. So we know that's the, a truth, that's this mystery that's revealed in the scriptures. But there's a, well, a couple of issues. There are three great obstacles. There are probably more, but I see three that really prevents Christ from forming in us. What are those three? First of all, I can call them the unholy trinity. <laughs> Me myself, and I, my flesh, my mind, and my pride. Those three things keep and prevent Christ, even though He lives in me. You see, the Lord won't force Himself on us. He won't force us to do anything that we don't want to do. He's a gentleman like that. He wants the best for us, but He will not take control and say, I'm going to force you down or force you to do something you don't want to do. And so these three obstacles, the flesh, the mind, the pride, our pride, those things we have to deal with. We have to, well, every day we will face this battle with these three. Sometimes we will face, we'll have to battle one at a time. Sometimes we'll battle all three at once. So when you look at the flesh, what is the flesh? Well, it, it's, the flesh refers to our physical body. When we are born again, we know that our spirit becomes alive. Our spirit becomes alive again, but as Paul would say, that we are a new creation in Christ, but we still have this flesh. This old flesh, we, as, as long as we're alive, we're going to have to deal with the flesh, this physical body, and this Human body, well, you see, we have basic needs. We all need to eat. I, I, I believe we know that, and, but some of us like to eat. Some of us eat to, to live, and some of us live to eat, right? <laughs> but, but it's a basic need, and, and, and we all need rest. Some of us love a little bit more rest than others, but we all need rest. We need clothing. We put on clothing and, and a shirt and the pants and... And that's, you know, to keep warm, especially during the winter time. We need shelter. All of those things are needed for the physical body. The problem with the flesh is it's never satisfied. <laughs> it's never satisfied. You never just want one chocolate chip cookie. You never want just one million dollars. 
you say, oh, well, if I just have one million. No, think about the richest people in this world. They're never satisfied with just one. It, 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 it's always the flesh always want more. The problem with the flesh, the fleshly desires and the needs can get out of control. When you, your desire become consuming and, and, and even dangerous to yourself and others who are around you. I can illustrate it in this way. A couple of days ago, I did what I was not supposed to do. I have a cat. And while I was eating some really good chicken, I decided, well, as the cat was watching me with those eyes, you know, if you have a cat, you know what I mean. And so I felt sorry for it. So I took a little piece of that chicken skin, just a little piece, and I gave it to that cat. And he was just excited about it. Woo! That was great. It's not the dry cat food. This was real food, you know? And so throughout the day, whenever I walk through the kitchen, I don't know where he is, but I'll get in the kitchen. As soon as I get in the kitchen, it's like, he's behind me. <laughs> he, he's, he magically appears and gives me that eyes. And so I thought to myself, I should have never did it. But the next day now, we had some food on our counter. And next thing you know, I saw he had a big chicken in his mouth. And he was running. I'm like, give me the chicken. And he is, Row! you know, with his, like, Freddy, you know, with his claws ready. Come on, I, I'll tear you apart, right? Just that little piece, he was not satisfied. And now he was endangering my entire family. <laughs> Don't touch my chicken, he will say. And I took a broom and tried to get it all away from him, and he was just growling at me. <laughs> In a way, we are a lot like a cat, right? We, we are not satisfied with just a little. We want more food. We want more pleasure. We want more money. We want more relations. We want more, more, more. And then the pastor comes. Give me some of that. Get, let me... Get, let, let me <laughs> Get away, pastor, you're evil. How dare you? You see, that's how we are. We, we, when, when we get, when we feed the flesh, the, the flesh, the desires of the flesh can come out, get out of control. But a second problem I see with the flesh is that the flesh, the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit. Listen to Galatians chapter 5 this time, verse 17. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things you wish. You want to be godly. You want to be a good husband. You want to be a good father. You want to be a good boss, employee, whatever it is. You want to be a good person. But the flesh is battling with the spirit. Christ is dwelling in you, and Christ is, wants to do a work in your life. But the flesh is saying, no, 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 I want to go out for pleasure. I want to go out and do this. I want to go here. I don't want to be in church. I don't want to read my Bible. You know how easy it is to, uh, well, how hard it is to spend probably 15 minutes reading your Bible? But then we can close the Bible and go and spend two, three, four hours watching television? You see, that's the flesh. The spirit desires the spiritual things, but the flesh, oh, it desires the fleshly things. It battles. You know, there was a story about a guy who had two dogs, and, and he would bring the dogs out to fight. And, and, and every time they fought, he will bid on the one dog, and, and it always seems like what the dog that he bid on would be the one that won. And so someone pulled him aside after and said, how is it that you know which one that's going to win? And he says, the one that I feed, the one that I feed. If you're feeding your flesh, your flesh would win. If you're feeding your spirit, your spirit will become stronger. It's the one that you feed. And so there's this battle, looking at Romans this time, Romans chapter 7, verse 15 and 18. It says, for what I am, I, I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, 
that I do. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what, I, what is good, I do not find. Paul, the apostle Paul, out of all people saying, I have this battle that's going on. I am battling with the, with the flesh. I want to do good, but I don't even know how to do it. Later on in this chapter, he said, who will save me from this wretched man that I am? Who will save me? And then he proclaims, the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, when you try to live godly, when you try to do good in your own strength, you will always find yourself battling. You will always find yourself failing. You see, a third problem I see with the flesh is that the more you feed the flesh, the more sinful you become. The more easier it is to, to, to sin. Look at Galatians again, going back to Galatians chapter 5. Look at verse 19 through 21. I'm going to read this time from the New Living Translation. It says, When you follow your desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurities, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, harlotry, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties and other sins like these, let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. You see, when you feed the flesh, when you participate and partake in, in sinful behavior, you will find yourself going from one sin to another, and the sins will get greater. You know, when I was... Uh, you know, a little boy going to school in elementary school. My dad used to come home from work and he would go and take a shower, take his pants and hang it on the door. And in his pants, listen, there was some change. It was some quarters. And so I, I knew I wanted some candy the next day. So I'll go in there and I'll take a quarter out. Oh, the next day I was going to buy me some sugar daddies and sugar mamas and, and, and some really good treats, you know. But I wasn't satisfied <laughs> with the quarter because that quarter grew into 50 cents and that 50 cents went into 75 and a dollar. And, and it kept growing until one day I heard, where is my money? <laughs> You see, the sin, it started small. It's just like bank robbers. You ever notice that, well, if someone robs a bank, why are they not satisfied? You just made off with 100 grand, but they go to the next bank until they get caught. It's, that's how sin is. You think that you're going to get away with it, but that's the way that sin is. The more you feed the flesh, the more that you will find yourself doing things, and then you will find... Well, I so often hear, how did I get here? How did that person get from walking with the Lord and now they're living a, a life where now you're even saying, will they even inherit the kingdom of God? Was they really a Christian? You see, it often starts really, really small. Another problem that I see is a problem with our mind. Yes, we battle about the flesh, but also our mind. We still have the mind... We're new creations, but we still have our old mind. Even though we are a new creation, again, we have our memory of our past life before Christ. Remembering our past experience, remembering our past relationships and our sinful pleasures and our past hurts. And all of those things are resources that our minds will go back to. I don't know how, how many of you have had this experience where you're maybe just finished reading the Bible or you're just going through the day and all of a sudden a song pops in your head that is an ungodly song from way back when. And you're singing it. It's like, where can he get it out of my mind? But you can't. Where did that come from? Listen, our mind is like a computer, is it not? 
it, it, the hard drive, it, the memory is there, and, and it needs to be wiped. But it doesn't get wiped that easily. It's there. Really, until we, until we pass from this life, that memory will always be there. And so all of the sinful pleasures and the sinful things we have done in the past, or so when you're now trying to walk with the Lord, you find yourself going back to things that you know you not, should not think about and even things that you should not do. You see, the problem, unfortunately, our memories from our past prevents us from becoming more like Christ. It makes us want to live in the glories of the past. It fills us even with fear. You want to go forward, but oh, what will happen? Because of the past, I can't walk. The Lord is calling me to go forward, and I can't because of fear of bad experiences and the flares of desires and sinful pleasures. See, our mind is a problem, but also our pride. Pride is having a desire to be great, to have power, to be admired, to gain attention, to be popular, to fit in with our, with, with, uh, you know, fit in or, or, or stand out of the crowd, to make our uh, name for ourselves. You see, all of that is attached to pride. Again, and the problem with pride, it blocks humility. The problem with pride, it, it blinds us from seeing the truth, from seeing our own sinful ways sometimes. And it seeks to rob God of the glory that belongs to Him. You know, there's a TV show, it's called Brain Games. And on there, it had a demonstration. They were going to, to determine who can drive better. Adults or teenagers? And there they did this, this demonstration and, and they had ob an obstacle course and they had to drive around and not hit the cones and stop at certain points and, and all of that. And, and what they found is that the adults, well, I should say the teenagers, drove just as well as the adults. Wow. Everyone thought that the teenagers will fail because the adults have more experience. But there was a little twist to this experiment. You see, after they did a round, everyone did their round in the obstacle course, and all of a sudden now they brought a crowd to cheer on all those who will go. And as they're going around the track, now they're cheering them, all right, go for it. And, and, and all of a sudden now, the teenagers start to bump and run over the obstacles. And, and, and what's going on? You see, because of this little word called pride, the teenagers, they care about what people think, so they were making a lot more mistakes. You see, pride is a dangerous thing because, well, if you consider, why was Satan kicked out of heaven? <laughs> Isaiah 14 tells us in verse 13 and 14, listen to the words of Satan. He said, you have said in your heart, I, have, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the, on the mount of the congregation on the, the furthest side of the north. I will ascend above the highest of the cloud. I will be like the most high. Do you see that one small word that keeps popping up? I, I, I. And whenever you see someone is saying I all the time, sin is not far behind because in the middle of sin, S-I-N, is I. <laughs> and pride is an I problem. It's all about me and my feelings and my thoughts and my ways and, 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 and my popularity and my, my, my I, I is again the unholy trinity, me, myself, and I. And so Satan was kicked out of heaven because of that. Marriages fail because of pride. People get into debt because of pride. Again, with, with our credit cards, especially around Christmas, we're going to buy things we can't afford to impress people that really don't care. But we're doing it because of pride. 
We have children that strive with their parents because of pride. We have a nation that's divided because of pride. And what's the worst part is that people don't obey God because of pride. God says that this is what I want you to do in my word, in his word, and, then, and people say, well, I know that's what God says, but I'm going to do my own way. See, that's the root of pride. So the solution to all of this, we have to labor, not in good works, but labor in giving birth to Christ in us. What do I mean? Listen, going back to Galatians, I'm going to read Galatians chapter 4, verse 19, but I'm going to read it from four different translations, just so it sinks in. Galatians chapter 4, verse 19, in the New King James Version says, My little children, for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. The New Living Translation puts it this way, Oh, my dear children, I feel as if I am going through labor pains for you again, and they will continue until Christ is fully developed in your lives. The ESV says, My little children, for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. And the NET says, my little children, I am again undergoing birth pains until Christ is formed in you. you. You hear the heart of Paul. And Paul wants one thing in this church, this Galatian church, who was once upon a time walking in the Spirit, and they began to go back to the, the, the law, trying to accomplish in the flesh what the Spirit of God was doing. And in chapter 2, he says, Oh, you foolish Galatians, chapter 3, excuse me, you foolish Galatians who have be, bewitched you, who have, who, who have fooled you. Now you're going back to the, the flesh, what God was accomplishing in the Spirit. And here he in chapter 5, now he's saying, this is what I'm hoping, this is what I'm, 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 I'm laboring, that Christ will form in you, that you will be godly, not on your own, but that Christ will form in you. So how are we to get Christ to be formed in us? In order to, for Christ to be formed in us, listen, first thing that I want you to take note of is that we have to crucify our flesh. Crucify our flesh. Uh, you know, it, it means putting the flesh to death. We, everyone in this church should be murderers, but not of someone else, but of our flesh. Crucifying the flesh. Listen to what Paul says again in, in, in Chapter 5, verse 24 of Galatians. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Verse 25, it says, And if, if, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So we have to crucify the flesh and walk according to the Spirit. What does it mean to be walking in the Spirit? Listen, it's to be spiritually minded. In other words, that everything you do, everywhere you go, every thought that comes to your mind that you're thinking or you're filtering it through the Spirit, through the Word of God. You want to be godly. You want to think godly. And so you go through the Word of God, the Spirit of God, as you're led by the Spirit. So we are to crucify the flesh. Crucifying the flesh means giving no, no provision to the flesh. What do I mean by that? Romans chapter 13, verse 14, it says, But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Don't hang out with people that will... Well, some of us, we, when we became born again, we still have friends, our old friends, that we know that are doing ungodly things. And what happens when we hang out with them? They drag us right back into the old ways. Uh, we, we're back, you know, <clears throat> getting drunk. We're back getting wasted. We're back listening to the worldly music that's influencing us. We're, we're back doing things that we're, we, don't, we don't really want to do. Again, we, we have to give no provision, 
I want to challenge you, and this is something I just personally just want to challenge you. For, take seven days and say, you know what? For seven days, I'm just going to turn off the world. I'm going to turn off the television. I'm going to turn off the, the radio. I'm going to spend every moment and every minute that I can possibly do and spend it with God. I'm going to re read His Word. I'm going to listen to sermons. If I put on the radio, it's going to be to listen to a message, to listen to worship. And every ounce, every hour, every moment that you just spend with the Lord and tell me in seven days how God has changed your life. You, you won't have to say, well, let me spend time trying to be a good person. No, just spend time with the Lord and let the Lord be formed in you and watch how your life has changed. And I'm challenging you that because it's something that I have personally experienced. That not only my life changed, but I see people around me have been changed because of just me spending time with the Lord. So crucifying the flesh means giving no provision for the flesh. Crucifying the flesh means putting no confidence in the flesh. Again, I'm not going to try to be godly. I'm not going to try in my own strength. Instead, listen to what Paul says this time in Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 through 9. Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 through 9. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Now, I'm going to gross you out here, but he says here, Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, I count them as rubbish. In the original translation, it's, it speaks of dung. <laughs> he said, I, I, I count all of my accomplishments, and Paul had a great amount of accomplishments. He was a Pharisee. He was going to be the top dog, you know. He was going to be the man. And instead, he said, you know what, all of that, all of my achievements, all of my self-righteousness, I counted as loss. To, so that I can do one thing, and that's to know Christ. And verse, nine, and, be, and verse 9, and to be found in Him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. You see, becoming godly is having faith that Christ will be formed in you. That's what it is. See, too many Christians are running around saying, I'm going to be good. I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. And we're just burning ourselves out instead of just sitting with Christ, worshiping Him, serving Him, loving on Him, and, and, and just watch Him change your life. It's his, it's his work. Remember, we couldn't save ourselves, and we can't clean ourselves. If it was possible, Jesus would not have to go to the cross. So give no provision for the flesh. In order for Christ to form in us, we must also renew our minds. Renew our minds. Again, we have the old mind, but we can renew our mind. How do we do that? Listen, this time Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 through 14. Paul again writes, Now that I have already attained, not that I have already attained, or I am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that which is in Christ Jesus, has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself as having apprehended, but one thing I do. Listen, one thing, Paul, this is going to do here. One thing, that is forgetting those things which are are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press towards the goal of, for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. You see, the old ways, the old thinking, the stinking thinking, if I can use that, of my past life, I don't want to remember those things. I don't want to remember those past memories and those past experiences. I want to put all of that behind. I don't want to go back to my past successes even. I want to press forward. I'm going to press forward to Christ. I'm going to look to Him. And of course, on the subject of renewing our mind, you, you have to go to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, and, and Paul again says, And do not be conformed 
to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You know, the more that you saturate your mind with the Word of God, the more you'll be able to renew your mind with the Word of God. Because if you think about it, our mind is saturated with all of the things from the past. All of our experiences, our hurts, our, our sinful pleasures. And, and when you're in a situation, someone cuts you off in the road. And what, what, what's the natural thing that comes up? Ah, how dare you, right? But if we have the Word of God in our mind, that's what's, that's what's going to be drawn from. That's what you're going to reach down to get, not... not the old ways, but man, the renewing, what, what, what does God want me to do? Bless them. Oh, come on in, you know. Go on in. That's what's going to happen. But if you don't have the resources, you don't have God's word hidden in your heart, you're not going to be able to do it. So again, I want to encourage you, spend time, a chapter a day. What does it say? A chapter a day keeps the devil away, <laughs> right? We, we got to get into God's word. Read a, word, a chapter a day. Uh, you know, join a, start a home group. When, when Gigi and I, we got married, that's one of the things we did very early. We started a couple's Bible study, and every week we were in the Word. Uh, we're, we're being held accountable because we have to prepare to teach. You know, you don't have to go to seminary, let me say that, so that you can open God's Word. Open, open your home and say, hey, invite a couple people over, get a Bible study guide, and just go through it. You will find that as you Study as you prepare, you're going to learn a whole lot. Man, get in God's Word. And when evil thoughts come, when old memories, that's when you're going to be able to renew your mind. And in order for Christ to form in us, uh, lastly here, we must say no to self and, and our pride. No to self and no to our pride. This time Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Again, deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. If you want to write it down this way, you can put no to self, death to self, and follow Christ. No to self, death to self, and follow Christ. But I want you to notice that word that's in the middle of it. Take up your cross daily. It's a daily walk. If you think that you can just read your Bible for one day and you're going to be good for the rest of the week, no, 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 you're sadly mistaken. Seven days with no word makes one week. I'm not talking about W-E-E-K. I'm talking about W-E-A-K. You're going to be weak, unable to fight your battles, unable to overcome temptations, unable to do and walk in the way that Christ wants you to walk. And so we have to deny ourselves, say no to ourselves. Some of us, we can't say no because we have been, been feeding the flesh. And everything that comes our way, we say yes to the flesh. You know, sometimes we need to look at ourselves in the mirror and say, no, you can't have it. <laughs> no to self. And then death to self, death to our, our passions and our desires. No, and, and put it to death. Give no provision. And then follow Christ. Meaning obey whatever he says. I love when, when someone just has... Uh, is just on fire for the Lord, and they just have a simple obedience and faith with, towards the Lord. If God's Word says it, well, I'm going to do it. I'm not going to question it. If it says it, I'm going to do it. Kind of like Abraham, when the Lord told him, I want you to sacrifice your son. Abraham never questioned the Lord. He didn't even go to his wife and say, Sarah, I, I don't know what I should do. God is telling me to to sacrifice my son, he didn't go to her. You know why? Because she would have said, well, that's not the Lord. It's not the Lord. She would have, she would have discouraged him. You know, he just took his son, he packed up everything, and he went to that mountain. And there the Lord stopped him. But you see, that is the kind of obedience 
uh, that is following the Christ, take, following the, 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 the Lord, taking up our cross and following Him. That's the obedience that we need to have. I'll close with this verse, Romans chapter 8, verse 29. The Bible says, For he, whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed into the image of his Son, that we might be the firstborn among many brethren. You see, the Lord, our Father, he wants and desires that we become like his Son. That when people see us, they don't see our old person, the old man, the old self, the sinful ways, the sinful patterns that we've been following in our past. Uh, they don't want to see, he don't want to see, uh, have people see us as, as that person who have an anger issue or have an a, a, a issue with, with, with lust or, or, or greed or whatever it is. He wants us, he wants people to see us he wants people to see Christ in us. He wants to see Christ formed in us. He wants to transform us, not from the outside. I want to be like Mike. Let me put on a jersey. Let me put on uh, uh, shoes. Let me, let me be a good Christian. Let me do this and let me do that. No, he just wants us to have Christ formed in us, and that's just denying self and spending time with him. And watch him change your life. Watch him make you into that godly man, that godly woman, that godly husband, that godly wife, that godly child, that godly employer, boss, whatever it is, he is going to do the work. Just spend time with him. Just sit at his feet and get his word in you and watch like a, a, a butterfly be uh, transformed from a cocoon into a butterfly. Watch him do the work. From the inside. Let's pray. Father, your desire is that we become like Christ. And as we go through your word, as we understand, well, it's simple to understand that we can do nothing in our strength. As Paul said, there's nothing good in us. Our best efforts will always leave us fallen short of your glory. And so we need your word, Lord, to wash us, to cleanse our minds. We need your strength by your spirit, Lord, to execute and crucify the flesh. Lord, we need your spirit to work in us so that we can be as Paul, pressing towards the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And it's only by your strength, Lord. But I'm glad that even as Paul would write in, in Romans, that in Christ we are more than conquerors. We are victorious. We one day will be better and we will be more like him tomorrow and in the future than we are today. Because you, Lord, you have began a good work and you're faithful to complete it. And for that, Lord, we say thank you. And for that, Lord, we say hallelujah. We thank you for working in our lives. And we thank you for revealing all these truths, Lord, in your word. We pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.